Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. Third, Sandra says, "I ditch you both for a hot piece of Irish us any day." She's right, you know. Angie says. I saw her looking around last night for any excuse to not come home. I can't believe you. I say again, my hands pressed into my temples. You really wouldn't have cared. Valerie, look, Angie says. We're just happy we got to see you on this trip at all. You weren't even supposed to come. We've had fun, more fun than we've had together in a long time. And if you didn't go to shambles or whatever with this guy, we'd have even more fun. But the whole reason for this trip isn't just for us to bond. It's for you to bond with yourself, to figure out what you want from life, to say yes when you'd normally say no. Sandra adds. It's January first, and you've already failed big time. I close my eyes and try to calm my galloping heart. So I wouldn't have been a horrible sister if I'd said yes. So I could have followed my heart and gone off with him. So I could have thrown all caution to the wind once again to see where I'd end up. I have to think. I tell them, pacing around the couch. This is a big deal. It is, Angie says. But I mean, you could at least talk to him more about it. Find out for how long. If you want to stay longer than a few days, you need to know that. I don't know. My ticket was cheap. I won't be able to change flights or get refunded. Sandra points a bottle of soda at me. So if you stay longer, which I think you should, because what the fuck is back in New York for you anyway? I would make him pay for your flight back. After all, you're doing him a favor. What are you getting out of it? Hot sex. I offer. Don't you think that might complicate things for you, though? Angie says carefully. I glance at her. She knows me. Once I sleep with a guy, I tend to fall hard and fast, kind of like I'm doing now. Maybe the continuation of hot sex is a bad thing. Don't turn her off the sex, okay? Sandra says to Angie. She looks back at me with raised brows. But I'm serious. What are you getting out of it? I should have a lot of answers for that. A chance to be with a hot rugby star. A chance to see the hidden side of Ireland. Maybe a chance I can write a travel article about it for freelance. But I shrug and the truth comes out. I get to avoid life for a little while and pretend to be someone else, to live a life that's not mine. Kind of like being an actress, Sandra muses. For no pay, she adds. I have enough money saved. I tell them. I'll be fine for the time being. Then I really think you should do it. Tell him yes, Angie says. If you trust him, if you like him that much, if you think you can handle it, tell him yes. Yes, yes, yes. The words start to pulse within me, multiplying and growing until I know it's the right thing to do. My whole body is fueled by it. 
Tell him yes. But I have to shake my head, my heart sinking. I don't even have his phone number. We didn't exchange them. Yellow pages. Angie suggests. Though I guess the average person doesn't list themselves anymore, let alone a celebrity. You know where he lives though, Sandra says. You just came from there and you have a good sense of direction. Kind of, I say. I know the neighborhood is called Ranala and I'd know the street if I saw it. But, I mean, we might be driving around for hours looking for it. Well, I don't know about you both, Sandra says getting to her feet. But I'm hungover as fuck and we're too bombed to do anything remotely fun today. So I think being in a taxi for hours while we hunt down your sexy future fiancé isn't such a bad idea. Oh. Does Ireland have McDonald's? Oh, let's get McDonald's. Mom would literally cringe if she heard you say that, Angie tells her. Fuck mom. Sandra says, giving the middle finger to no one. Yes to burgers. Yes to Val saying yes. Yes to everything. Let's fucking go. Padraig. After I dropped Valerie off at her hotel, I made sure I spent enough time thoroughly berating myself for suggesting anything to her. I don't know what the bloody fuck I was thinking. I wasn't thinking. The truth was, I'd woken up at 5am and couldn't sleep. She was snoring her head off in a deep sleep and I didn't want to wake her so I went downstairs to the living room, made a pot of coffee, and let my thoughts run loose in erratic patterns. I never should have tried to make sense of any of it. The waning alcohol in my system and lack of sleep, coupled with the hot sex with a beautiful stranger, Plus the news from my neurologist and news about my father created a massive black whirlpool inside me that wanted to consume me whole. There were no right answers. There is no right future. There is just too much to fucking handle right now and for some bloody reason I thought that Valerie would be the solution to at least some of it. I thought that if I brought her to shambles, my father could see that I was going to be okay. But that's just the surface reason, the shallow reason. I'm not worried about my father's peace of mind in that respect because I don't think he really cares much about what happens to me. I don't think he actually spends his nights worrying about me and wishing that I'd end up in a kind and loving relationship get married, be a good father, continue the family name and legacy. I don't think that's the case at all, no matter how many times he or my nan try to spin it that way or bring up my mother's wishes. The bigger reason, the pettier reason, for bringing Valerie to shambles and putting on a charade of happiness, is that I don't want him to think that I failed in life. He may not worry about me, but he does judge me. He thinks I should have done more with my life, even though I've done more than he ever has. Now, with everything hanging in the balance, with my future so uncertain, it struck me as the only thing that made any sense. Bring her to shambles. Pretend that I've been hiding our relationship from the public and family until I was certain. Tell him we're engaged to be married but with no rush to plan the wedding. Let him see that I'm worth something to someone. And, if it does give him peace of mind after all, let him know that I'm going to be okay after he's gone. 
The idea was ridiculous and I knew it was a mistake the moment it came out of my mouth. I've had countless one-night stands and hookups and I wouldn't have had that thought with any of them. But the redhead is different. I know I don't know her in the conventional way, but I know all the parts that count. I know that when she looks at me she doesn't see some unstoppable rugby star. She sees something else, and even though I don't know what that is, I know she likes it. And I see a woman who has been ravaged and spit out by life. Dealing with a disability at such a young age couldn't have been easy, and every perceived weakness she has, I just see someone who has had to turn inwards when life got too hard. I see someone who seems to be running to life for once, instead of away from it. I'm not sure what that says about me. Perhaps I could learn a thing or two. But you can't, you Egypt, I tell myself as I pull a bottle of beer from my fridge to help with the hangover. She's gone. You scared her off. She couldn't run out of this place fast enough. It's just as well. She's just passing through. She's got her own problems to deal with. Selfish and foolish of me to think I could rope her into mine. The thoughts rattle around in my head as I take my first sip of beer and then I'm pondering if I can just keep drinking all day long so I don't have to face anything, when there's a knock at my door. It's not unusual to have neighbours drop by. I don't really know any of them personally, but a lot of families ask for favours, like could I give some words of rugby encouragement to their son or would I say hello to someone's die-hard Leinster fan grandpa. I put the beer away and sigh, gathering whatever strength I have to put on my game face that I were to deal with the public, and open the door. To my surprise it's not a family but Valerie with her sisters flanked on either side of her. Hi, she says with her big blue eyes. I know only a few hours have passed since I last saw her, but to see her back when I thought I'd never see her again, to see her fresh-faced on my steps, with the white snow framing her crimson hair and her crimson hair framing her pale face, it's like an angel has landed on my stoop by mistake. Hi. I eye her sisters. They don't seem like they're here for sinister purposes, but you never know with girls. Though I was more or less an only child, our neighbours growing up had five girls and they made it their mission to torture me. Hi, the actress one says sticking out her hand. We never officially met. My name is Sandra. Hi Sandra, I tell her, giving her hand a firm squeeze, impressed at the strength of her handshake. Very professional. Nice to meet you. What can I, ah, do for you all? Your accent is amazing, Sandra says, gushing. So maybe just keep talking. Valerie clears her throat and steps forward. I didn't have your phone number and I wanted to talk to you, so I had a taxi drive us around until I recognized your place. I raise my brows. That's the last thing I thought she would have done. It didn't take too long, Sandra says. The driver knew where you lived anyway. Say what? That's concerning. Don't worry, she says. I'm sure he's cool. Can we come inside? Of course, I say. Opening the door wider. 
I'm in such shock that she's here that my manners have slipped. They come inside, and the actress immediately starts poking around the living room, looking at books and rugby trophies and framed pictures. I offer the three of them some espresso to which they all eagerly accept, and while I get the machine whirring, Angie pulls up a stool at the kitchen island and stares at me while I work. Never seen an Irish man and an espresso machine before? I ask. She narrows her eyes at me and then slowly nods. Only at the Starbucks next to the hotel. Just want to make sure you were who I thought you were under the unforgiving light of day. My brows raise again. And what's the verdict? I think you're trustworthy, she says and leaves it at that. Angie, Valerie says and elbows her. Be nice to him, he's making you coffee. I am nice. But if you're going to run off with a stranger and pretend to be his fiancé for a few days, I'd like to make sure he's not an axe murderer. I wouldn't be a very good sister if I didn't do my due diligence. What? I ask. Could you repeat that? I want to make sure you're not an axe murderer. I give her a pointed look. No. The pretending to be my fiancé thing. I glance at Valerie and now I recognize that hopefully shy and almost giddy expression in her eyes. You had another think about it. She nods. Yeah. I told them about your father, I hope you don't mind. Her expression falters into something like shame and it's absolutely adorable because of course I don't mind if it means she's here. They told me it was a good idea. Well, we didn't say it was a good idea, Sandra says. More like an interesting idea. She comes over to the table and plunks down a rugby calendar from a few years ago one where I appeared naked on the cover. I try and keep that thing buried under stacks of books so I'm amazed she was able to unearth it in such a short amount of time. Maybe she has x-ray vision for Cox. She points at it. Care to explain why you're naked on this French calendar? I reach over and try to swipe the calendar from her. All rugby teams do it every year. And yet they picked you, she says, holding it up in the air and trying to compare the two of us. It's because I have an incredible ass, I tell her. Your sister can attest to that. I just wanted to see Val's face go red and it does, all the way to her roots. Sandra snickers in response. Fair enough. So, can I keep this or is this your only copy? It's all yours. Lord knows my nana has a stockpile of them that she insists on giving to her church congregation. Thank you, she says, sliding it into her purse with an eager smile. Anyway, Val says, clearing her throat while giving Sandra a dirty look. I just wanted you to know that if the offer still stands, I'd love to take you up on it. We stare at each other for a moment and I'm hit with the knowing that something is going to change. I'm not sure what but her sudden commitment to this crazy ill-conceived idea of mine means that her need to say yes to new adventures is bigger than the both of us. I'm in her orbit now as much as she's in mine. All right. Well, 
we leave tomorrow morning. We better get there before lunch or my nan is going to bring out a spoon. They all stare at me, brows raised in unison. I take it your nan didn't whack you with a wooden spoon when you were young? No, Angie says. Our beatings came from our mother and were mental, involving the deliberate erosion of our self-esteem. Subtle, but effective, Sandra adds. What time tomorrow? Should I meet you here or? Valerie asks. For a second I'm disappointed that this means I'm not spending the night with her, but obviously I'm both thinking with my dick and being selfish. I'll come pick you up at the hotel at nine, I tell her. Sorry if that's too early. I can't promise she won't be hung over, Sandra says. It is our last night in Ireland together. The crazy thought of Valerie meeting some other guy tonight, some guy who doesn't have an outlandish plan of lies, makes a hot coal of jealousy burn in my stomach. Shite, I've got to get a hold of myself. This possessive version of myself, especially over someone I have no right to get possessive over, is entirely new to me. Perhaps you two should, you know, exchange phone numbers, Angie says with a bemused look on her face. Might come in handy during the fake fiancé thing. Tell us again why you want to do this. Since we still have our espressos to finish and they've only heard the truth second hand, I tell them the same thing I told Valerie. In the end, Sandra has watery eyes and is clutching her chest, while Angie looks moderately affected. Then they leave and Valerie and I say goodbye for now. It's just a wave as she makes her way to their taxi which Sandra had called without me noticing. A wave that's distant and awkward and shy, the kind of wave you give someone you don't know very well. And that's when it hits me that I don't know her very well. And I'm about to take her home. To see my nan. To see my father. And have her pretend to be my wife-to-be. What the fuck could possibly go wrong? The next morning I have my stuff packed in the back of my KN and I'm heading over to Valerie's hotel. The snow has transformed into grey slush and everyone looks positively miserable at the prospect of going back to work. I'm honked at twice for reasons I can't discern, and by the time I pull up to the hotel, I'm ready to get out of Dublin before the city starts to implode. Valerie is waiting on the steps, talking to the hotel's doorman. I get to observe her for a moment before she sees me. Am I doing the right thing? Do you trust this girl to lie for you? Don't you wonder why she would? I can't say I haven't been asking myself those questions a lot over the last 24 hours. But now that I'm looking at Valerie, the doubt subsides. Just enough to think that maybe this will work anyway. I mean, the woman is gorgeous. Even when she's smiling politely at the doorman, and also frowning in such a way that it makes me think she can't understand a word of what this guy is saying, she exudes something that I can't put my finger on. I'm not poetic or worldly enough, perhaps. The best I can say is that she reminds me of the first day of spring. Not the arbitrary date in March 
but that first real day when the sun is out and the air is fresh and you close your eyes and you can almost feel yourself being reborn again. I can't say I've ever gotten that feeling from someone else before, and it's just enough to cause my rapidly beating heart to slow. I take a deep breath and get out of the car, heading to the steps of the hotel. Good morning, I tell her, coming up beside her. Are you ready? Now that I'm closer, I can see the shyness in her eyes, the fact that she's as unsure about this as I am. As I'll ever be, she says, and the doorman attempts to grab her suitcase but before he can I've already scooped it up and I'm gesturing to the car. Meanwhile I can hear someone else behind us talking to the doorman, is that Padraig McCarthy? That fool should be back in the game. He looks fine to me. I wonder when they'll learn I'm anything but fine. I put her luggage in the trunk and quickly go around to her passenger door, opening it for her. Such a gentleman, she comments, looking impressed. Definitely not a gentleman. I say as I go around the front and get in my side. Just a man who knows his manners. She buckles her seatbelt and gives me a smack. In America, that's a gentleman. Nah, I say with a shake of my head, pulling out onto the busy, slushy street. I reckon a gentleman is someone with class and education as well as manners. That just ain't me. As you'll find out, I was born a country boy. How many people are in shambles? she asks. About a thousand. Her eyes widen. Wow. That's not exactly a place where you can go and hide, is it? I grew up in a suburb and it's like everyone in your cul-de-sac thought they were entitled to your business. I chuckle. Yeah, it's kind of like that. You get used to it, but believe me, if you want to fool around with the neighbor's daughter, you better believe that half the town knows about it the next day. I take it that happened to you. Yeah, but they had a lot of daughters so it was a common occurrence. She laughs and runs her fingers down the side of the window. Well, I have to tell you that as nervous as I am, I'm looking forward to this. You're nervous? She rubs her lips together and nods. Oh yeah. I mean... She tilts her head to look at me. This is sort of insane, you know. I'm aware. But it takes two to do something like this. One to suggest it and the other to go along with it. Ever the diplomat. But I'm serious. She clears her throat. Yesterday when we were discussing how long I was going to stay, you said a few days. But don't you have to stay longer than that? She cranes her neck to look at the back of the car. You've packed a lot of stuff for just a few days. Right. Well, I think I'm there, until I don't have to be. I don't want to talk about what I really mean and I know she gets it. But isn't it suspicious that I suddenly just leave and I'm never seen again? I shrug. Yeah. But we'll just say you're going to America for work for a month or two. Right after we got engaged. That doesn't seem right. I mean, 
I was just engaged and never would have done that. I glance at her sharply, heat in my chest. You were just engaged. She gives me a wincing smile. Yeah. He broke it off a week or two ago. A week or two ago. I repeat, dumbfounded. I'm not sure how this is going to make things more complicated but I have a feeling it will. I probably should have told you. I just thought, you know, a one night stand doesn't need to be anything more than that, we don't need to lay it all out. Although this was my first one night stand, so maybe it's common to run away with that person to their hometown a few days later. What happened? I ask. Is that why you're here? I thought it was the job. It was both. His name was Cole. Or is. Cause he's still alive. I didn't, like, murder him, don't worry. She gives me an endearingly goofy smile. Anyway, we were together for a year and engaged for six months, and I lived with him and everything. A week before Christmas he said he didn't want to marry me anymore but he still wanted to be in a relationship. So I grew a pair and told him that if he didn't want to marry me, I didn't want to be with him. She grows quiet at that, as if she's wrestling with something inside that she's not sure she wants to share. I wonder if she regrets it. And the job? And then I got laid off a week later, as you know. So I went from living in this wicked apartment in Brooklyn with my fiancé and rocking this dream job, to having no apartment, no fiancé, and no job. I mull that over. She's had a much tougher hand dealt to her recently than I thought. I'm starting to feel bad that I'm roping her into this. Look, I say, I had no idea it was like that. This makes things a little more trivial now, doesn't it? We're still in the city, I can drop you off. No, she cries out. No, no. Please. That's my past. But the past often rears its ugly head. So let it. I'm tired of running from it, running from everything. I want to move forward. And yeah, this is a crazy idea, but I think there's a reason that this is happening for the both of us and so I think we should just see how it plays out. With an empathetic look on her face, she reaches over and puts her hand on my shoulder giving it a light squeeze. Then she smiles and giggles bashfully, her hair falling over her face. I'm sorry. I forgot how amazing your shoulders feel. You're a fucking tank, you know that. My lips quirk into a quick smile, constantly flattered by her even though she's saying things many others have said before. She clears her throat and takes her hand away, as if she's been caught doing something she shouldn't. Anyway, as I was about to say before I touched you and got all distracted, I hope this is all okay. You having an ex-fiancé? Of course it is. It was presumptuous of me to assume that you wouldn't be attached. She gives me a steady look. Listen, I would not have hooked up with you and I probably wouldn't have even flirted with you if I was with someone else. I am a one-man woman. And for now, in this world, I'm her man. I inwardly wince. 
This is the second time today I needed a kick in the bollocks over my fanciful thoughts. So, while we're on the subject of disclosing stuff, why don't you tell me about your past relationships, she asks. I should probably know as much about you as I can if we're going to pull this off. You make it sound like a heist. It kind of is. She pauses, studying me for a moment. Have you thought long and hard about this? I'm not questioning your motives or anything, but you are essentially lying to your dad, your grandmother, the town, etc. What happens? She trails off, licking her lips. You know, down the road, when we go our separate ways. Even if I leave after two days, eventually they'll catch on that I'm not coming back. She's talking in such finite terms that it bothers me. I shrug. It'll be my problem. I'll tell everyone we parted amicably and it didn't work out. So this truly is just for your father? I nod, looking her in the eyes. It's all for him. He's dying Anne. I need to do this. Okay, she says after a beat. Okay. She's smiling now. I'm going to help you in whatever way I can. Now, let's get started on the nitty gritty stuff first. We have, what, two hours in this car? Let's see if we can create a believable relationship in that time. Valerie. I've never had two hours fly by like this before. Then again, I've never been in a car with such an enigmatic and striking human being before. Usually in these situations I tend to blather on like an idiot in an attempt to fill the awkward silences, but with Padraig, there are none. We've been talking the entire time, hammering down the details of our faux relationship. But as much as he both puts me at ease and fills my belly with butterflies, I'm still a nervous wreck around him. Because, what we're doing? It really is insane. In some ways I'm surprised my sisters were okay with me walking out of the hotel room this morning and into the unknown, though it may have had something to do with them being both hung over again. I thought maybe Angie would have pulled me aside last night, having changed her mind or come to her senses. That didn't happen, and now I'm here, in his Lux car and heading down Ireland's east coast, toward his tiny hometown of Shambles. So yes, I'm nervous and time is flying by way too fast. I don't think I've quite gotten down what I need to. So, give me the gist of it again, Padraig asks, as if he can read my mind. Because you already forgot. Because I'm testing you. I pass my lips together as I try to suss him out. Fine. Here it goes. We met at the same bar we actually met at, but this was almost a year ago. When though? Man, he really is testing me. March of last year. And when did we get engaged? At Christmas. And how did I propose? You took me for a walk along the river after our favorite meal at our favorite Chinese restaurant, and you got down on one knee and asked. Simple, yet effective. Speaking of, 
I say as I wave my hand at him. Where's my ring? He looks sheepish at that, which is to say, he looks positively adorable. Who knew that term could apply to a big burly tank of a man? I don't have one, he admits. Everything was closed yesterday and it's not like I keep spare engagement rings at home. Well, I hate to break it to you but it's a very important part of the engagement. Right. Well, actually, I was thinking, I could ask my father if I could use my mother's. My heart lurches to a stop. What? I ask, why died? No. No, that's not right. You can't do that. It would mean something to my family, he says. But this isn't real, my God, don't you think that's almost insulting your mother, to your parents' love, to use their ring for a fake engagement? He grows silent at that, dark arched brows knitting together as he drives. Okay, so I've made him mad. Maybe I was a bit harsh. I'm often blunt, but the harshness isn't like me. Padraig, I say, loving how his name sounds. I need to say it more often. What I mean is, I just feel like that might do more harm than good. At least it could invite bad juju. He raises his brow. You mean curse me for any marriage in the future? Don't worry, I won't be getting married. I don't know why that surprises me. Earlier we had talked a bit about relationships and I told him all about Cole and some losers before then, and I learned he was an eternal bachelor, though he wouldn't quite pinpoint why. Still, I didn't think he had an aversion to it. Way to pick guys who are only about the engagement, foe or not, I think to myself. Then I stop myself. I'm not picking him. We aren't dating. This isn't an extended fling. This is just me helping out a stranger because. I'm saying yes to new adventures. That's the only reason why. Or because I do like him and I want to pick him, and I have this terrible, Harmful idea that's been growing in my stomach like a seed threatening to bloom, a seed watered with naivety and hope, that wants to turn all these possibilities of us into something real. That scenario isn't good. If that seed blooms, it's only going to lead to future heartache, and I've already been through enough. I clear my throat to break the silence and to diffuse my inner awkwardness. So, what's our sleeping situation when we get there? I mean, where do I go? He gives me a curious look. You're assuming that we sleep in separate beds? I nod. I have an Irish grandmother too, you know and I know she doesn't look too kindly on couples sleeping together before marriage. Though she wasn't a fan of using wooden spoons. I'd like to hear more about your Irish grandmother. I'm saving it for dinner conversation. I've created a whole database of conversation starters for the next few days and I'm proud to say that none of them include the weather. But don't you know that's all they talk about in shambles? Such is the curse of a seaside town. The wind blows in and the wind blows out and that's about the most that happens. Back to your grandmother.
We'll be in separate rooms, he says with some finality. I'd be surprised if she'd even let us stay on the same floor. She's old-fashioned. I could already tell from that spoon comment. I don't want to get on her bad side. I better abide by the rules. And, well, honestly, this is a bit of a relief. What Angie had said the other day about the fact that I get emotionally compromised when I sleep with someone is totally true. I hate to think that our one-night stand will remain a one-night stand, but on the other hand, if I can keep a clear head, then all the better. Plus, the last thing I want to do is explain to Padraig why I'd want to keep my distance in the bedroom. The fact that I don't even have to tell him is a bonus. I'm staring at Padraig, because that's what I've been doing a lot on this drive, when he suddenly starts gripping the wheel tighter and tighter, his knuckles turning white on his large hands. Are you okay? I ask him just as his eyes pinch shut in pain. I look to the road and the fact that we're on the wrong side is confusing me, thinking we're going to die. I'm not used to the way they drive here yet. Then when I look back, his eyes are open and unblinking. I'm fine, he says. Just had a dizzy spell for a moment. Like a panic attack. Because I definitely get those. That's probably it. Do you want to pull over? Do you want me to drive? He looks at me, squinting in disbelief. Have you ever driven on this side of the road before? No, but I'm sure I can figure it out. I don't want to tell him that I've been wincing this entire time because it feels so damn wrong to be on this side. I'm fine. Really. Just overwhelmed. I can only imagine, so I leave it at that. For the rest of the drive I go over our fictional engagement until it's starting to sound real, though Padraig definitely has something on his mind as he gives me nods and grunts and one-word answers. Finally, the road curves out of the rolling green countryside and a wide estuary appears in front of us. The sun seems to come out from behind the thick clouds for just that moment too and I smile at the way it glints off the water, feeling serendipitous. Welcome to County Cork, Padraig says as we drive over a bridge and the road hugs the water on the opposite side. Soon, the town emerges, a narrow slip of stone buildings along the waterfront, interspersed with bright, candy-colored buildings. And welcome to Shambles. It's so cute, I say, staring at all the charming pubs and restaurants and stores selling wool and gnomes and clover souvenirs. With the narrow cobblestone roads and stone walls, it fits the quaint Irish town of my dreams. Except, as we keep driving through and out of the town, a wide expanse of sandy beach runs alongside the road. A beach, I remark. For some dumb reason I didn't picture Ireland having white sand beaches. We have plenty of beaches like this. There are miles of them down the coast here. In the summer, you can go swimming. In the winter, you can always go for a polar bear dip. That sounds like something a macho rugby player would do after a few beers. Maybe, he says with a small smile. 
After a few minutes of driving along the sea, he takes a road that heads inland through green hills bordered with crumbling stone walls and low hedges. Piles of melting snow are dotted here and there. We slow near a sign that says Shambles Bed and Breakfast and he turns onto the long gravel driveway flanked by a wide expanse of lawn. A B&B? I ask, surprised he didn't tell me about that. Best one in town, he says, winking at me as he puts the car in park. I have to say that or I'll get the spoon. In front of us is a rather large two-story stone house done up in stark white with an undulating thatched roof. I'd heard about all the thatched roof cottages and houses in Ireland and desperately wanted to see one. I get out of the car and take in a deep breath of air. Even though it's the dead of winter, there's a freshness here. The air is chilled but damp with the sea and it feels like I'm waking up for the first time. Either that or the jet lag is finally wearing off. She's pretty in the spring and summer, Padraig says, stopping beside me and staring at the house. But my nan takes good care of it. Your grandmother runs this place. Yeah, he says and then looks over to the green painted door that's opening. Now you can finally meet her. I'm not sure if he's saying that because he's already playing the role, but out of the front door steps who I assume is his grandmother. And she's not at all like I pictured. For some reason my mind conjured up this tiny round woman wearing a perpetual apron and permanent scowl, her hair kept under a bonnet. For one, she's tall. Even though she's got a hunch, she's at least an inch taller than me, I can see why she'd be so formidable with a wooden spoon. Her face is pale and wrinkled, with deep folds around her mouth, yet her eyes are bright, curious, and shining. She's bundled up in a big coat and I don't think there's an apron underneath. Her white hair is kept back under a scarf, though, like a young Queen Elizabeth. Padraig, she cries out. You're late. I can barely understand her thick accent, or if she's genuinely upset or not. Padraig takes my hand and gives it a squeeze, his warm palm pressed against mine, contrasting the chill outside. In that squeeze, I feel everything that's going through his head with what we're about to undertake. He's home and I'm here with him and this isn't going to be easy. What have I gotten myself into? Nana, he says, pulling me over to her where she waits by the front door, her coat pulled tightly around her. That's when she really notices me, notices us holding hands, and her gaze becomes sharp as an axe. We stop in front of her and her eyes run up and down me in inspection before looking back to Padraig. Where are your manners, boy, she says to him, jerking her head toward me. First of all, you haven't introduced me to your girl here, and second of all, you never told me you were bringing company. I should have known. I could have cleaned up. The good Lord knows this place could have been fully booked and there would have been no room for her. Padre gives her a patient smile. Are the rooms all booked up? Ack, no, she says almost angrily. It's January. There's only the Major here. The Major? I ask. 
That's what I call him, Padraig says to me. Ever seen Forty Towers? I nod. Well then, you know the Major is the old man who lives at the hotel. We have a Major here. He has a name, his grandmother chides him, even though she's the one who called him the Major first. And speaking of names, what the devil is your name, miss, since Padraig has lost his manner somewhere on a rugby pitch? I hold out my hand. I'm Valerie Stevens. Her skin is rough and calloused and she gives my hand a bone-crushing shake. I try not to wince. You're a Canadian, she says to me. No, American, I correct her. I'm from Philadelphia. But I live in New York. Oh, I did. Her eyes narrow at that. Very unimpressed. I've noticed a bit of hostility from people here when I tell them where I'm from. Yeah, she says carefully. She brings her sharp gaze to Padraig. Where ye find this one then? Don't think you've ever brought a girl home before, let alone some American. Ye snatching up tourists? Kind of. How about we make the introductions inside where it's warm, Padraig says. And where's my hug, anyway? He gently pulls his grandmother into a big bear hug and my heart seems to grow a few more sizes. OOF, she says, trying to get out of his embrace. You trying to kill your owl nana? She manages to pull away and heads through the door. Okay, come on, come on. I'll get a pot of tea going. We step inside the front hall and I'm immediately met with a rush of warm air. The place is all white stone walls and wood floors and so many cozy earthy knickknacks and thick rugs all over the place. Hang up your coats on them hooks. Take off your shoes, she says to me, pointing at my boots. Put on those slippers, miss. You too, boy. I hang up my coat and quickly unzip my boots, picking out a pair of handmade wool slippers that are all lined up in various colors and sizes along a low bench. I put on a pair of dark green ones and to my surprise Padraig chooses hot pink. I giggle, and he shrugs. They're the only ones big enough for my feet. I know my nan knitted these as a joke, she just won't admit it. What are ye blathering on about, she says as she disappears around the corner. Don't think my hearing has gone. The devil has cursed me for having to listen to your nonsense until the day I go. She then mutters under her breath, won't be a moment too soon. I look wide-eyed at Padraig. She's both hilarious and intense in her grumpiness.